And welcome to the Sketch Zone podcast, folks. I am Carlos Gomez. And this week, we have with us a creative technologist from the frozen tundra, Adam. Really? Pass me my house slippers, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Welcome to the show, Adam. Thanks. And with us in the lineup, next in the lineup, let me say it like that, Charlie B. Williams III. Hello, everyone. Carlos is more like the rainy season here than the frozen tundra. Uh, it's, it, uh, what you call it, Adam lives in, in Minneapolis. Well, I'm just saying, it's good for Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack is here. <laughs> it's nice here, just saying. Really, Jack? You really you went there? <laughs> you started you there? Uh, like an unsaying rule of not to do that. We uh, all know nice uh, in California. No. <sighs> yeah, well, there's been it's been raining crazy here in Sonoma. Yeah, at least you're not in wine country, so. Yeah, <laughs> it might be. We might not have per, picture perfect weather That's right now, but at least we have picture perfect wine to make us forget about the weather. There That's you go. like a weird oxymoron. At least you're not in wine country. <laughs> Come on. They're all Speaking They're all of wine, no, just... we talked about Jack. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a reply. I see how this is going. I see it. I just, yeah. I wish I was in the white country. Okay, move on. There it is. Uh, I wanted to talk about Justin Bieber. Why? Really? You were for real about that? You got two minutes. <laughs> Is it too late to say I'm sorry? Cause I... I'm just kidding. I just wanted to see you guys go crazy. Look at Charlie. I almost turned off his computer. Yeah. I'm playing, Charlie. <laughs> hey, Charlie. Yes. Did you go to an event tonight? Were you? Justin Bieber oh, concert? Did you go to Justin <laughs> Bieber concert tonight? Uh, Jack, I hate you. I like you tonight. <laughs> I went to... Adam, have you, ever, have you ever been to a Justin Bieber concert? I have not. No? Uh, you're missing out, bud. You're not a believer? <laughs> you're not a believer. Not a believer. <laughs> I, felt, I felt bad saying it. Do you, ever, do you ever feel it's too late to say you're sorry? <laughs> you could just listen to that in the car. Dude, it's been in my head all day. your head all day, long. right? Got yeah. you. Let me tell you something. That kid, he's a knucklehead, but he came he came hard with this album, dude. Paul. It's a party starter. Not gonna lie. <laughs> it's a party starter. It's a party starter. Yes. I started getting out my dance moves. I dust off the dance moves and I'm like, pow, pow. No, it's never too late. Pow. Pow. Hey Charlie, you went to automation tonight, huh? Yes. <laughs> 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 I so hate your segues. <laughs> like, boom. Start I'm like, how do I pull out of a, a plummeting Justin Bieber line of conversation? <laughs> I was just letting you go. No crickets, no nothing. Did, I wanted, yeah, to, just, I wanted just, to see that train wreck. So just just you just have to pull the emergency brake, okay? Just the awkward. It's like, Jack, you put the pull him back. He didn't. He eject. He hit eject. <laughs> he eject. And, we're, and we're stuffing you back in. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Kate Stanley. <laughs> so automation. Uh, yeah, I went to one. It's uh, number sixteen. Uh, it probably looks backwards there, but no. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was at a different place. It was at the uh, Prey Center for the Arts. What sure. exactly is uh, automation? So automation is a sixteen-year-old festival that the Illinois Institute of Art and Shaw almost legal. Almost legal. <laughs> sixteen-year-old <laughs> festival that our old school alma mater, uh, puts on. And it shows the best of the student body, mainly in the media arts program. Um, so that, that runs the gamut of uh, game, uh, media arts, photography, mo uh, motion graphics, uh, videography, you know. What section did they have you judge? I judged the 3D section. So weeks back, they sent me like 12 or 15 different Videos and I gave them too my late line to learn 3D. <laughs> Some of them, yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> he said some of them, yes. <laughs> but, but it was great. It was great. Um, we talked about this before the show, and one of the things is that like um, you're always student work is always going to look like student work, but then you always have that 
cream of the crop that kind of rises to the top. So there was a lot, good, a lot of good ones. That Isn't I that a rap song? Cream of the crop that rises to the top. Rise to the top. Your ADD is Who like is that? on 100 this evening. Dude, I got <laughs> zero sleep last night. So I, I see. It's almost like when you had Red Bull that one. <laughs> you remember that one? Oh, that was, that was a special one. No, but yeah, it was good. Um, it was cool. Um, they gave out awards and stuff like that. and They put my beautiful picture in the in the program, so it blessed everyone to see my beard. It was awesome. Yeah. You know what's cool is it kind of blends in from. What are you trying to say? Because outside the frame, like okay. your your face looks what? looks like it's actually why does it, part of the. Why does it blend in? Because your beard is black, and so is the page. I don't think it's that dark though, Carlos. From here, it looks like exactly that. Like your beard is taking over the entire page, and the words are literally on and your just, beard. And they're being hugged. <laughs> <laughs> they're being hugged their beard. Is that what you're saying? Like they're being cradled. By the They're awesomeness. Being cradled by the missing link that is your beard. Beard? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it encompasses all sorts of creativity. And like no. It was a it was a great show. It was a good good job for the students. Congratulations to them. And yeah, that's what it was. And if I'm not mistaken, back in the sixties, Jack won that show, right? In the sixties? <laughs> <laughs> or two thousand and That's when I went electric. <laughs> <laughs> Shock the world. I didn't even have to pee outside no more. Yeah. <laughs> no, what year was it, Jack? Uh, I honestly have no idea. Um, oh, oh, 01? No. Oh, what was the first four, one? 04? 3? I don't even know. Let's say 04. Uh, Let's say 04. When did you move? I think it was 04. Yeah, 04. That's the year I graduated. Yeah, so it was the last year. I remember. But no, I, I, I felt probably this... right around 16 years ago. No, because that was the no, first one. Was Jack a... wasn't going there yet. I was in like the third or fourth one. Remember, oh, I went to. You? I got there two thousand. Okay. You know, October two thousand. Okay. And they started yeah. automation like oh four or something like that, or something like that. Yeah. No, yeah. but I, I I was happy to do the judging. I I felt the need to show up too because I always thought when I was in school, they had a lot of different judges. Um, that's when they used to fly in more judges from like California and like Disney recruiters and stuff like that. So. As a student, that I was a multimedia judge one year. Right. As a student, you want I wanted to see the judges. I wanted to see the people because I actually read the you know programs and thought it was um, a good opportunity. You never know. I mean, worked for you, Jack, right? <laughs> it did. It actually did. Um, <laughs> yeah. We had a was, success story. I was a category winner, and I was also a judge many years later. I think I did number ten. Okay. Were you in California when you judged? Yeah, they like still were doing the whole flying people out type of thing. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, they just told me to drive over. <laughs> right. well, where are they gonna fly you to? You're gonna. Fly I don't from, know. Take you yeah. to park. I just jump in the plane, fly from Midway <laughs> O'Hare. <laughs> he does a loop around Chicago, lands. Or you take off from Midway, land in O'Hare, then yeah. you have to take the train down. So, no, I thought it was good. It was, it was always surreal, so it was kind of cool that they asked me to do it this year. I was happy to do it. And one of the conversations that we're, that we're having was, uh, do you guys think that um, if technology gets better, does the skill level of the students get any better when they go to graduate? I, I don't think it does. Um, mm -hmm. Nope. You know, it's. I, I think photography is a great example of that. Where I look at, oh, good job, uh, yeah. Look, look at compositionally. You know, a hundred years ago, or Ansel Adams, even, or any any of the versus digital photography today. Um, in a lot of ways, technology makes it easier for shitty artists to rise to the top. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. Speak on it. We can call this a show. That was yeah, it. Yeah, and we're, we're off. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think music, too. You know, if you guys have seen the Sound City documentary that Dave Grohl did, there, mm. two inch tape, everything was acoustic, or not acoustic, um, analog. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to now, they, they were saying, like, most of what you hear on the radio is made in some on someone's laptop, and so, yeah. but the but that doesn't change the principles of music. All it does is put tools in the wrong hands in most cases. Right. Um, but that said, I think uh, as we were talking about earlier, 
it, it can make a good student even better, faster, like with video editing. Video editing 10 or 15 years ago was a pain in the butt because processors mm -hmm. weren't there, the equipment wasn't there, digital video was still kind of finding its way, whereas now you can shoot stuff on your iPhone and be editing on a, on a MacBook in less than a minute. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think it makes them any better because I still like tonight when I was judging saw student work and look like student work. But it does, maybe if you, you're a great artist, it does give you an advantage um, a little bit because um, it helps you get your your ideas out a little bit faster and so right. it, or helps you give you maybe uh, golden nuggets of inspiration, you know, um, where you would have to do a lot, something else a long way, you know, especially with like when you get into 3D and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, because like, I always joke around about when I was when I was going to school for 3D, it was like 3D Studio Max two, yeah, and you only had what was it? I think six of the little spheres that you were able to put color on because yeah. we didn't even have textures yet. Yeah. Um. So you were a modeling fool, mm -hmm. and then you only had like six colors to pick from. <laughs> So, yeah, but you know, you, you also look at you also look at what was what was coming out professionally at that time, and that stuff that bar was much lower, at least technolo technology wise, right? You know, it's like Luxo right. from Pixar was like really simple, very limited. Um, but what they did right was they know how to compose shots, and they know how to animate, and they know how to tell right. a story, and that's the stuff yeah. that I think gets missed in young artists. I will say there was speaking of Luxo, there was a Luxo like type piece where they had the uh, jumping uh, you know uh, lamp you know over the eye or whatever and then the eye went to a wireframe and then from the wireframe it turned into this weird like box where they end up killing the lamp it was really dark and then, <laughs> and, and then the, the the word says we don't play well with others it was so weird I, w I wish I could have met that, at that <laughs> What were you thinking? Are you saying that you hate Pixar? What are you saying with this piece? <laughs> but I was like, this is, it was like, you know, the lamp found itself in a torture chamber, and it was, you know, just how things escalate and doesn't make sense as you, as I'm like explaining it. This, this is how it looked when I was looking at it on screen, but it was kind of hilarious. <laughs> so, so Adam, uh, you know, we're talking about how technology affects an artist uh, how does technology and and it's it's rapid changing affect a creative technologist I think it depends on the creative technologist and what their background is um, I I don't actually come from a technology background I come from a art and design background I, I you know I have, a, I have a bachelor of science degree but it's from an art school but I got you know, but but then I got a portfolio scholarship from photography, so it's kind of it's kind of a kind of you know it's oh, just wow. a mess of of uh, of things led to that. But I, I it does two things, um, and I think they work against each other a lot. One thing is you're you're always inspired, you're always curious about something new, you're always having ideas. But the problem is for someone like me, you get spread too thin, and. You know, it used to be digital was a website. Well, then it was a website and some social media. Well, then it was social media, website, and some apps. Well, now it's wearables. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, machine-to-machine -machine type stuff. It's the Internet of Things. There's no end to it. And I think the danger you can fall into and the danger I've fallen into is you have so many ideas every day that you can't focus on any one of them, and therefore you don't get anything done because your, your mind is at any given time in, like, ten different places. So, yep. <laughs> you know, so. we were just talking about we were just talking about that very thing earlier. Yeah. Before the show. Uh, I got this new uh, twenty-seven inch monitor, and I was working on three and four different projects at the same time. Um, and and that's just been me. I work on everything until nothing gets done. Yeah, and it's it happens to me too. Um, if, I'm, if I'm stuck on one project or or you know need a mental break, I'll. I'll research another project, or I'll have an idea. And stuff. <laughs> There's a oh. new browser tab. By the end of the day, I've got ten tabs open with all these different, <laughs> like partially researched things that I kind of have yeah. going. So, uh, yeah, 
it's, it, it, I think it contributes to ADD. But again, the great thing is that there's no really no limit to what you can create anymore. I don't. I nowadays I don't feel like I'm limited really by anything other than time. There's, right. There's, Resources out there. There's enough technology out there. There's enough collaborators out there that it's it's really just you need an idea and time. Yeah, and and I think um, I think one of the important things that I know I've learned in the past probably year is that it's okay, you know, to reach out to some of my friends. You know, I have a lot of creative friends, and Adam and I have actually worked on pitches before in the past. Um, I don't necessarily have to do everything. It's okay for me to rely on some of my friends. Right. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing to to remember too. Like you said, is there's if if there's any chance I can hire a designer or someone with 3D modeling or anything, I'll I'll outsource that because it's one less thing I have to learn, and I know it's going to be better than anything I can do. You know, in, right. in probably half the time. Right. So you were saying in the beginning you. You were a designer. You were a photographer. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were a kid, what was it that you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, I actually, well, yeah, <laughs> I went through this pilot phase in first and second grade where first it was I saw Top Gun, so in first grade I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And then <laughs> second grade I was a little older and a little wiser. I wanted to be a commercial airline pilot. Um, and and then, then you wanted to be a volleyball player. <laughs> No, but uh, from third grade on, I want to be an architect, actually, and work okay. on, like, a commercial architect. And so much so that I, w I went to architecture school, and then in my first semester, I was like, like man, I don't know if I can do this, or um, just didn't have the passion for it. When you see these upperclassmen spending 23 hours a day in studio building models, I don't mind putting in work, but it was, um, it was about that time, that was 99, 2000, that the, the web was there, but... From what I remember, it was the first time it was really mainstream and becoming more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that really interested me. And I thought, wow, I can take, like, you know, any digital idea I have and make it interactive. And that was such a new, at the time, such a new concept. So that's that's kind of what, what led me down that path. Um, and then uh, in high school, I got a pirated copy of Photoshop. And ah. that... <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure you know, but but I but I had I had so much disposable time, so I just learned that, and then that became digital imaging, which became design, and then I fell in with the wrong crowd and started doing development. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that happens in those years, you know. <laughs> it was yeah. college, you know. Everyone was experimenting. Everybody doing weird <laughs> things. Yeah. You code one app. <laughs> right. <You know. laughs> Basic is your gateway code. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you graduated with a degree in. It was uh, visualization. So it's uh, actually Katie was just asking me about this earlier, and I I still don't. All these years later, I still don't have a great example or uh, explanation of it. I would. Say, <laughs> oh, <no>. Yeah. <laughs> I got the degree now. It's and still paying for it, but um, I'd say it's it's a uh, it's a left-brained approach to right-brain thinking, or maybe I forget which brain is. It's a right-brained approach to left-brain thinking. Is that what, taken what, from the college catalog? <laughs> I, I, it's, it's just something a, a buddy of mine said. And it, it just stuck, but um, crazy. I was going to say, how do you explain that to your parents? Right. <laughs> Mom, Dad, sit down. Uh, so I want to think left-brained, but on my right side. <laughs> well, what it what it was is it was the business side of creativity, and that's what oh. that's what my dad was was about. Is it wasn't, you know, in that school, a designer would get a brief to do a poster or something, or an animator might get a brief to do a certain film or maybe a title sequence or something. Um, filmmaker might get a brief to do a commercial. This program went through the thinking of what's on that brief in the first place. So they, we, we analyzed what the business goals were of the client. We, we analyzed what the audience actually wanted to get out, you know, what, what they were looking for in a, in a certain product, um, learned how to do focus groups, account planning, that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Sounds like project management a little bit like there was a problem I work with. Yeah. With. And, and the great thing is um, a lot of it was night classes because people from Fallon or Carmichael Lynch would come teach classes. So I learned account planning 
from the guy that launched the Citibank account at Fallon. Mm. And I learned copywriting from the guy that the guys that wrote for Porsche and BMW. So the awesome the the breadth of um of teaching there was was pretty big. But the idea of the program, and in a lot of ways, it should have been a, a a grad a grad program. It really didn't make sense as an undergrad, I didn't think, um, because that program didn't work unless you had a skill to apply it to. So it, it really taught you how to think strategically and in terms of systems. We didn't turn in final work. We we turned in prototypes with basically a roadmap of hey, hey here's a baby, here's a rough example. The assumption was that you can find people to execute. That's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out what you need to do in the first place and then and then put together the team to, to execute it. And you know, that's again, that's one of the 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 big things that art schools just don't teach. You know how easy it is to jump on YouTube and learn Photoshop? There's a lot of there's a lot of people out there that know just enough Photoshop to hang themselves. <laughs> and they're making and they're making money off of it because they know how to get out there and they know how to do the business end of things. Yeah. Whereas an art school will take you and they say, "Oh yeah, this is really pretty. Take a look. Oh, you should submit work to Artimation." But they never teach you um, things like uh, if you design a logo, how do you actually get paid for it? Yeah. Do you take half up front, and then if they have the logo, do how do you get your other half and stuff like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, nuts and bolts of just um, yeah. I mean, the whole free the freelancing is a whole other conversation for sure. But yeah, it's 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 more um, MCAT especially was so conceptual, which was great. But every now and then it's like, hey, give us some down to earth, real world. You know, how how do we take this and execute it and actually get paid? I think that piece was kind of mm, Yeah. Yeah, I think those are very important skills that, that a lot of these art schools or a lot of the kids that are going to the art schools are missing out on. Um, so it's it's really neat that there is at least one place out there that's that's arming you guys to get out here and, and actually work on your hustle. Yeah. So then uh, you graduated, you jumped in, and, and what was the first job that you had after you graduated? The, fir the first job I had, um, it, it actually started as an internship. I had to get an internship to graduate in the first place. So, um, and there was a little mini recession in 2003, so I actually worked construction for nine months and then, and then got my first agency job at Carmichael Lynch. And that was an internship, full-time internship. Um, and it was, I was literally on the ground floor of the place. My feet were cold every day because it was February. <laughs> and, uh, but at the time, at, that, was, that was 2004. At that time in Minneapolis, this was a hotbed of, of great ad agencies and great accounts. I mean, you had, you had both Porsche and BMW in town. You had both United Airlines and Northwest when they were still around. You had Citibank, you had Harley Davidson, all these monster brands that you got to work on. Um, one of my first projects as an intern was actually a Porsche ad for the uh, homepage of the Wall Street Journal. It got like a million hits in a day, which was which for an intern that's like a big deal, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just right, out of the, right out of the gate. But then I that, they ended up hiring me, and I was there for about three, almost four, about three and a half years mm. before I moved to California. Whoa, what part of California? Uh, San, I was in San Francisco for about a year, and then. Uh, Right. Yeah. Um. And then move back here because I I kind of miss Minnesota. Um. And then Gordon for punishment is what it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, through a layoff in an apartment building fire, I ended up in Chicago, and then um, <laughs> and then ended up. On, <laughs> then I got recruited back to Minneapolis. And that was about six years ago. So I've been here since. So when you were in Chicago, that's when you got the Leo Burnett gig. Yep. Yep. And that's where we met. Yeah. Um, is there a difference between the work that you were doing at a big, huge ad agency like Leo Burnett um, and some of the smaller places, well, I'm assuming smaller places in Minneapolis? Um, well, not just Minneapolis. I would say uh, Evolution Bureau in San Francisco, too, was at the time was a smaller operation. I think it was about 20 or 30. 
I think the biggest difference for me was the, the scale. You know, Leo Burnett and, and within that arc, I mean, Leo Burnett was so big, you had a 600-person digital, 600 digital agency inside of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh, that's our digital division, that's 600 people. Um, you know, and that's one of, let me, let me interrupt you, I'm sorry, but it, that was one of the things that I always found interesting. Like, Leo Burnett and ARC Worldwide would be bidding against each other for the same gigs. Right, right. I never got that, because it was the same team that was going to be working on the yeah. same product. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? How does it... I guess That's I didn't my know point. <laughs> You guys do two pitches? Well, no, no, no. I explained that. So what? what's the deal? What's the difference between ARC and, and Leo Burnett? So Leo Burnett is a traditional ad agency. They, um, they work on exactly that, you know, TV commercials, the magazine ads, and did all that stuff, right? Right. And so you had ARC Worldwide, who was a digital agency. So they work okay. on Whoa, okay. on you know websites and and CDs and all this stuff, right? Apps, installation type things. Yeah. So Leo Burnett went and absorbed them, but they said, "We're not gonna we're we're not gonna take you all the way in. What we're gonna do is you're gonna you're gonna remain Arc Worldwide, but when Just we go tip. out to pitch, you know, because there's there's some places that." didn't really like Leo Burnett. They liked ARC. And then there's other people that were pissed off at ARC for whatever reason, and they, they would rather work with Leo Burnett. But at the end of the day, it was the same people doing the same work. Those right. people in that company that had a Leo Burnett card and an ARC card. <laughs> were there two pitches? Yeah. So, and did so the client submitting two different pitches is who did yeah. the client know that they're effectively the same company? I don't know. You would think, right? Because there's a lot of those like that's so weird. There's a lot of those houses now. Like a lot of them. Could you imagine suit. the one? Can you imagine the one guy? He walks in and he does the pitch for let's say Leo, and then he walks out. He walks into the elevator. He tapes on a mustache and he walks right back into the meeting room. Now I mean, he right. doesn't even need to do that. He just, like, <laughs> walks on it, goes through the revolving door, and comes right back <laughs> Takes his jacket off, and it says, Now awkward. he's got, like, a crooked, <laughs> shitty mustache. So, like, I hope this pitch doesn't seem familiar. Have you heard this before? Stop me if you've heard this one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this stupid yeah. client is like, oh, we like this guy much better oh, than the other one. He's so personable. <laughs> and they're English. cheaper. It's the English accent. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Is that like? Is that like? A, is that how they land it? It's like the first time they go in, they're like, "This will be a million, and then the next one goes in, and they're like nine hundred thousand. They're like, "It's so much cheaper. Let's go with them." <laughs> or then you you mess around, and the guy who's actually doing the pitch has like different voices in his head, so he starts fighting with himself, <laughs> trying to get the better the price. Man, you know what I mean? The pitch man <laughs> so is a like multi it. multiple personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, Man, this, that's really bizarre. Well, well, that seems common though. Like, there's a lot of post houses and like, and and like ad agencies that have like, like their own little small division, like arc inside them, right? That's like, this seems like that's a, no, a notion I've noticed. Yeah, since I mean, doing this. I, yeah, I mean, when I was at Digital Domain, they absorbed several or partnered, you know, with like a VR company, and they absorbed, you know, like a, a motion capture thing, and but. I don't think they were ever bidding against each other, and it was always kind of like under the same umbrella. I've never heard of like bidding against yourself. Yeah, to make, it, yeah. to make it even more uh, of an interesting story, before I went to Leo, I worked at this place called Digitas. They hired me to do some animation and some, some programming and stuff. So I was there. They're under the same umbrella. So you have the corporate umbrella, and then you had... Arc, Digitas, and Leo. Which makes who sense. All, who all basically do the same thing. Yeah. Right? So now if you if you if you have three little circles, right? You have the three little circles. Um but then the little arc circle ended up inside the little Leo circle. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Does that make sense? So it was it was it was <laughs> Yeah, it was a whole yeah. thing, and I'm like, wait a minute, what? Be, we did, how about, okay, so, 
Because I can see that happening, like, because Leo has such a big building, right? I can see it happening mm-hmm. if, like, the dudes on the 20th floor, you know, Ark was, you know, down lower, you know, are bidding on this project also. So it felt like it was different. But to me, what it sounds like now is they're bidding on the same project, but at the same time, oh, Leo got it. Cool. All right, send that down to Ark so they can fix, they can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. We got it. Good job, guys. Send it on down so they can, so they yeah. can start on. <laughs> and Carlos is like, oh, this one. Carlos Adams is like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> this is what we're Adam, doing. What, Adam, what <laughs> projects did they have you working on when you were there? Um, not a ton. I worked on. I know I worked on the Black and Mild site. Uh huh. It was like a. I got. I got my fingers on that one too. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, oh. artists had their hands on that one. And then oh, I was. Yeah. Good job, Jack. I was brought in as part of the cleanup team on this like bear hunting site. I don't remember what it was called. Wow. Um, I think that's one. Because it was a game, right? Yeah, and it was like a game that went way off the rails, and everyone was just trying to like fix it and get it out. Yeah, that was my project. Okay. What they did was they said, okay, so we originally uh, estimated three months to do this project. Can you do it in three weeks? Oh, that's right. But but there was a there was an outside company that did the core. Yeah, they built the game. Yeah. They built the game, and then they just basically gave us hooks that we can go and, like, get the get the score. Yeah. Um, and the different, you know, all They that. did it in three weeks? Dude, I was a zombie. I remember, that's the game. Yeah, I worked till, like, midnight on my birthday working on that game when I was down oh, in Chicago. It's got a special oh. time. Special oh, wonder you left. Yeah. <laughs> Special memories of yeah, that. Yeah, let me. Oh, dude. Special memories. It was. It that was such a train wreck, and then, <laughs> and then there was this one part we're trying to deliver, and I'm I'm sitting here trying to figure out. the The project itself worked on the testing server, but then when we went to like the dev server, it wasn't working, and so. Long story short, I started just tracing out all of the information that was being passed by the database. And I had just, I mean, I worked all weekend long, and I kept telling the database guy, can you please just check the database? It's, it doesn't make sense why it's working here and not working there. He's like, no, the database is fine. I checked it already, da, 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 da. So Monday morning comes in, all, kind of, all kinds of drama happens, right? And then I sit at my desk and I start tracing out absolutely every bit of information. Come to find out, the guy didn't copy the entire database. He was missing, he was missing one column of data, and that's why the thing wasn't working. Everyone's looking at me like it wasn't working, and it was all his fault. He's like, "Oh, uh, hang on, one second. And like <laughs> literally ten minutes later, everything was working absolutely fine. Oh my gosh! And you're just thinking, my weekend, my entire weekend. You're like, cool, I'm going to bed. See ya. See you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I dropped the clock. Just leaving. See you later. Yeah, that was... Uh, I'll oh, have to tell you guys about that one, because that's a, that's a... They still tell that story in the hallways of Leo Burnett. <laughs> they still <laughs> tell that story. Uh, and then you moved to... You said you went back to Minneapolis. Let's talk about that one burger joint, because I went to visit you... Not this past New Year's, but the New Year's after New Year's before. before that. Or burger. And you sent me to this place that had these burgers with the molten hot lava cheese. Oh on yeah. The inside. Did I send you to Matt's or there's another one? Matt's is too simple of a name. No, it was Matt's House. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, what was it called? Five hundred one bars. No, what was that called? I I know the that burger. Might, you're talking about. I have a picture of it somewhere, but yeah. yeah. You have a picture. Molten um, hot lava cheese? Yeah. yeah so what they did... Like, that's the gimmick, or burn your mouth, or what? <laughs> no, it was hot as hell inside. <laughs> that, that cheese was hot. So they take... They, it's a it's a hamburger patty, <laughs> and on the inside, they have this melted cheddar cheese from, like, Innovative. the gates of hell. <laughs> <laughs> and then they bite into it, they make it, the hamburger... Burn. Yo, my, uh, you know how maybe you might take a sip of coffee, and <laughs> you're like, and that one taste bud gets swollen, you're and like, it doesn't ooh, quite, yeah. and it always hurts, and then you start biting it, and you make it worse, right? 
<laughs> Imagine that, but your whole entire tongue is burnt. <laughs> and now the lava is spreading in your mouth. <laughs> so it's like napalm now. <laughs> it's this delicious. Part, now you you can't feel your tongue anymore. You have the burnt tongue feel, <laughs> but it's the whole mouth, and you've never experienced that before. And it's only getting hotter because it's like burning plastic that's spreading in your mouth. Because there's some chef was like, I'm gonna "Burn this one." <laughs> yeah, he just squeezes it, it in. Goosey Lucy. So, uh, Ooh, that's, that's, that's the it. name of the burger you had. Yeah, that was it. So, it was delicious. so did you, so did you like the burger? <laughs> it was delicious. It was delicious, but it's probably a lot like getting hooked on heroin. It might be fun, but it really sucks at the end. Like, you're missing teeth now. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Uh, so then after you left Chicago, you moved back up to Minneapolis. Yep. Um, we've Every time we talk, um, you've always had this very, very clear focus, I want to say, of owning your own business, running your own show, doing all this stuff, which now makes sense to me because you went to school and they, they prepared you for who you are, and it makes absolute sense. Um, did you always want to run your own company, whatever it, whatever it was that you ended up doing in life? You know, I really didn't. Um, in fact, in some cases, I actively tried to avoid it, uh, mostly because it's it's a lot of I'll see this with a lot of people, especially in um, in in our field in design, production, any, any anything, anytime you're making something, people are like, oh, I want I want to run my own show, I don't want to go corporate, blah 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 blah. I never really had that because I I think I knew the value of building a network at an agency and and just and just learning from someone better than me. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a big reason I went to San Francisco is because I kind of felt like I was I was doing about as good of work as I could do here, and I wanted to go somewhere where I sucked again, and so I thought San Francisco is a great place to do that. Um, but there there'd be times freelance freelancing was a, was a constant through really for the last fifteen years, and so every now and then it was like oh could I do this full time yeah maybe but then you run into the problem of getting big clients. You run into the problem of um, getting those big clients to pay you, mm. and then and then finding more. And so it's kind of like the, the 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 dilemma you face is, hey, I, I'm really good at this thing. I love doing this thing. I want to do this thing as my own business. Well, then you get so busy running the business that you can't do that thing that led you down this whole path in the first place. Exactly. And so that's um, the current business I run. I, I have a co-founder, which is made it all possible because we split the business duties pretty evenly. So all like the uh, finance stuff and the accounting, and he, he takes care of that. I've handled a lot of the legal stuff and business development stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's been a pretty good balance. But I, I think, um, you know, this last, this last time deciding to just do it was kind of like, you know, there's just not a lot of, there just wasn't a lot of great work here in town. Um, specifically for me, because coming from a flash background, and seemingly overnight, that just went away, that work, which was ironic because I was busy right up until that happened. Um, but I, th I think it was just a perfect storm of a lot of work coming, um, a buddy who wanted to take the leap with me, and, uh, you know, that was just, that it just kind of happened. So about a year and a half ago, we, we, we took a leap. That's exciting. That's yeah. awesome. <clears throat> um. So I left you a little message. Do you yeah. do you want to show some of your work? Um, I could do that. Okay. I'll uh, yeah, I've got my. Did you see the screen that. sharing, the screen sharing uh, button up there on the left? Yeah. Yep. Green one. Screen share. Okay. Try this out. I've got my I've got my my personal portfolio site ready to go, so I can just go through that a little bit. Oh sweet. Cool. Um, I can choose what tab I'm seeing. Yeah, choose which which window. So if you have the the browser up with your portfolio, or just choose your desktop or whatever, and you can even your... select one of the browsers. I, mean, yeah. I could share entire screen, probably, huh? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Knock yourself out. Just as long as you hide those nudie pics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So can you guys see this? Yeah. Perfect. Man. Okay. Yep. 
All right, so, gosh, where do you want me to start? And, if you're, and if you're listening on iTunes, uh, when you get in front of the computer, go ahead and go to invisiblemaker.com, and you'll be able to see what we're looking at. Yeah, pick whichever one you want, maybe your favorite one or interesting one. Yeah, I think um, I'll probably start with Buffalo Trace. This was uh, really probably would have been a flash site not long ago, but it couldn't be because we had tablet and mobile uh, requirements. So um, this is the type of work that I didn't think we'd get for about a year or two, and we got this project literally the day after uh, <laughs> after we signed our lease about a, about a year ago. Oh, wow. That's funny. Um, actually, through Sarah Tunstall, Carlos, who, who we worked with at, at uh, Leo Burnett. She's, mm -hmm. she's in New York now, so it's kind of a weird... Oh, no way. Who knows who kind of, yeah, really almost serendipitous in a way. But it's a and that goes to that goes to show you that um, working at big ad agencies or working at the bigger companies, if you're an animator, don't don't feel like you shouldn't go work in corporate because things like that will happen, uh, where someone who likes you and likes working with you might have a uh, a project available, and then they reach out, and oh. there you go. I love that we're talking about this. Uh, this week, and um, we'll keep going with this. I, I, I love to keep showing stuff off, but this is like my main pet peeve uh, with the whole, uh, the more or, my, or my main pet peeve and my main thinking when I tell people uh, this of like building networks and stuff like this. This is one of the reasons why I like working and you know building stuff up first. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, we should yeah we should come back to that because that's a really good conversation to have too. Um, but this this site was. We still show the site off because it's just it does so much. It does. There's custom analytics in it. There's animation. We had to do um, we had to do like video sequences for transitions and things like that. But as you guys know, video on on a web browser, or, I'm sorry, mobile web browser, doesn't really work. So we had to convert all those to PNG sequences, write JavaScript code, to then reanimate them as stills, and uh, play with. <laughs> uh, it was crazy. But the idea is you're, here is you're making your own bourbon recipe. The, the, the creative brief that the agency got, with the, the agency that designed this is Bajibot in New York. The brief they got was that they need to increase interest in bourbon without increasing demand because there's a, there's a global bourbon shortage right now, mostly because oh, wow. of uh, everyone drinking, drinking co craft cocktails and things like that. They're running out of bourbon because the stuff takes you know, 10 to 15 years to age. Huh. So... Um, this was just really to, to better educate people about what they like. Buffalo Trace makes about, I think, 20 to 25 different types of bourbon and whiskey. And so what this does is this walks you through the steps, and then it shows you, hey, you should try this one out. So I think for this example, I got Blanton's um, as, my, as my recommendation. But there's, there's 320 possible outcomes of the different settings that are on here. Oh, whoa. How long did this take? What was the, what was the, what was the timeline? We we cut our teeth a little bit on this one just because it was Kevin had done a lot of front end like HTML5 stuff mm -hmm. and I and I had done some javascript but a lot of action script and I had to bridge those two worlds during the course of this project. It's I'm trying to think. It took probably 2 or 3 months was most of it, but there was lots of little copy changes, there were some design issues um, where some responsive things weren't really thought through. So there was some back and forth on getting those getting those things cleaned up a little bit. That's including the converting process with uh, from the video to PNGs and stuff. And yeah, um, well, yeah, and the 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 design agency did all the uh, did the like the 3D sequences and stuff like that. Oh, okay. But there but there was there was probably another month or two of optimization. So um, yeah, I get it to look smooth, right? And if yeah. for it to feel like art director or curated, yeah. And not just that, but it's, I mean, this thing will work just as smooth on, on an iPad or, or an iPhone, too. They're, they're, they, they are doing a, um, an iPhone app, which I, I never got a clear explanation why. It, it, I think it's just so they can be in the App Store. But um, we spent a lot of time getting this thing to work right on mobile. Huh. So, um, so it does work on, on iPhone and iPad. Awesome. Um, Another thing. What I are the What are some of the similarities that you come across uh, when you're working on this new HTML on these new HTML 
five uh, projects versus like back in the day when we were working in Flash? Um, I, you know, I think, I think at that point you break it down to to code theory and and design patterns, um, and that's that's kind of what hindered me from getting into JavaScript sooner is that I didn't, no one really sat me down and, and explained to me what, um, you know, concatenating and using Grunt to to compile everything together and minify everything. Once I just took the, it really was only about a day, maybe half a day to figure all that out. Um, then I could abstract all my code like I used to an action script. So, for example, you might have a main file and then a, a view object and then a nav object and then you know maybe data controller. Um, it was it was pretty pretty nuts and bolts on this one. There's there's a lot of frameworks like Angular and React JS that that make that pretty simple now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think. I think it was important for me to do a lot of it by hand just to really understand structuring a JavaScript application mm-hmm. and persisting data. This the, the page doesn't refresh on this site. Everything's just it's just mm-hmm. views loading in and out of the page. Nice. And, and would you say that was your this is your base project then for moving forward for the rest of the stuff you've done at your well, company? Because it seems it sounds like it was like a lot a big learning uh, curve it for was. this one. And we want to do more like it, but being in Minneapolis, those clients are tough to come by. Really, here it's more about um, you know hardworking sites, a lot of WordPress, a lot of good. To, everything's well designed. It's just the clients here have different needs versus like big brands on the coasts. Okay. So we so we're, we're doing a lot, kind of both. We're we're about fifty fifty um, agency versus direct to client because it's really about cash flow. Mm-hmm. We we do a lot of really creative agency projects, but there aren't enough of those yet to to sustain our all of our all of our costs. Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of direct client work too. In those cases, we'll bring in a designer because we don't we don't have creative on staff yet, but we'll just collaborate with a designer and, and walk the client through the whole process. Um, we've got we've got a couple great direct clients that we worked with that's made things easier. Oh, awesome. Um, what one else? more. One more project I wanted to show, just because we brought up uh, a- Action Script, is this uh, this Olson All Star project. I think I'm still sharing, right? Yes, yes, you're good. Um, yeah. So uh, this is actually an Air app that ran these these t- ten windows around a building. I can see around the corner here, um, and that, this is for the 2014 Major League Baseball All Star game. This is the agents. I was at uh, Olson for a couple months, and they're their building is right next to Target Field downtown, so they thought, "Hey, we should do something in our windows." We figured out how to project images onto bed sheets, and that that was the whole brief. And so they, <laughs> I, I got to uh, I got to really creatively concept, sell the concept, and then actually produce it. So that was like pretty much a microcosm of my entire college experience. Yeah. I, wrote, I had to write the brief that was going to the president, and the CMO, to say, "Hey, yes, we should spend the money on doing this." Mm-hmm. And so we, uh, we used a, a Instagram hashtag Olson All Stars, and that 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 aggregated pe- images from everybody. We had interns have a mobile web app that I wrote, just just a mobile website, um, to like uh, moderate everything. And then once they were approved, they went onto these these windows, and everything animated around the building. So here's here's a couple in- interior shots, um, some of the the load not the load testing, just the performance testing on it. And then, um, and then just interior kind of making of shots. It was pretty bare bones. We didn't have a ton of money for hardware, so we were just like grabbing every machine we could from um, conference rooms. In the end, we had my main laptop running five slave computers through socket <laughs> on the network, and a shared network hard drive to to run everything. So it was really it was more coding because we didn't have a lot of hardware. So, oh, nice. but it was pretty cool because now I. You know, with with actually good hardware, it's like okay, let's do let's do twenty screens, let's do thirty. Um, the the projectors were rented, but the actual machines running it were all controlled just through sockets. So, how do you explain a an Air project compared to a, an HTML project compared to a Flash project? Um, I think it depends where it's going. You know, if it's if it's if it is going to be on desktop versus mobile versus web. Uh, I would I would say the approaches are probably similar again if you break it down to like software design patterns of what what the thing needs to do, um, 
I was I was in the the U.S. Bank Stadium preview center today, and they it looked like they were using HTML5 apps for all their touchscreen stuff, mm -hmm. which is fine. I, I think it probably just came down to the skill set they had. What I like about Air versus HTML5 is it gives you a lot of um, a lot more native functionality that you can get at a little bit easier than HTML, and things like updating, things like um, any system tray type stuff if you need that. Uh, I, it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer because there it really depends on the context of where the project's going. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, if you want to show us that mosaic project, that one's really cool. Oh, yeah, that's actually kind of dormant right now. It's, it's being reworked a little bit, but I do have the case study here. Uh, so this... This was actually a, uh, the the mosaic idea um, was actually a rejected concept for a client that uh, we were supposed to aggregate together all their social media pictures. Um, they ended up not using that, but I, in the process, I, I came up with this way of doing um, doing these really quickly generated mosaics with all real time controls, so that the codes. Oh, wow. come yeah, the code is completely different from, from what that little prototype was that I did for that client, but um, I, I was, I was going to make like a, like a Facebook app out of it. This was back when Facebook, app, Facebook apps were a thing. This would have been summer of 2011, I think. Um, and I have a friend who's a wedding photographer, and she said, hey, do you think you could make that into a desktop application? I said, yeah, that would be easy enough. And then she asked about what controls you could have. Could, it be, could you have contrast and coloring and everything else? I was like, yeah, that's all. that can all be changed real time. And so it turned into this whole big thing. I've got I've, the patent's just about finalized, um, so we have IP for it. But it's uh, it's a really organic way of building photo mosaics. I think I have I'm trying to think if I have examples here. Um, yeah, here's a couple. So um, the the dilemma here is that photo photo mosaic software isn't really a new thing that they've been around for quite a few years. But the limitation is that. Let, I'll use I'll use a bride and a wedding dress for example. If, if let's say you let's say you want to make a, a mosaic of a bride and a groom, but you only have dark images, what happens mm -hmm. to her dress? Because all the other software wants to do color matching. Right. And so what mine does is it does just just pretty basic blending, but what we patented was the real time controls of everything. So you can change grid size, you can change how much of the of the main image from underneath is coming into the cells. You can change. Oh, wow. um, you, you could. You could even. You nice. could make that. You could make your background image black and white, but have the cells only carry the color from what would have been there, and and just some really decoupling things. This this image in the upper right, it's a little bit hard to see, but this is actually um, using a displacement map, so the cells aren't straight grid. They actually contour to her to her face and her hair and some of her features. Oh wow! And then, oh. and then in the, in the lower. Lower left, you'll see the bride kind of stands out from the image. We built a masking tool, so if there is any region of the image you don't want cells, you can mask those out. And so um, the bride and her attendants are, are masked out. This, this isn't the best example, but you can see that there are tiles there, but then on the people, they're kind of masked out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then with this, uh, with this San, San Francisco example, there's with the overlay blend mode, you can see that there's you get a more organic look toward the toward the lights and the darks, and you you can you can flip it so it is more of a traditional um, like block mosaic. But it's I I, I think That's for me cool. this was such a more organic way of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. This this is down here was the first test print. This um, we were about to launch and I ran into a, a just this guy at a wine bar in my building and. Um, he turned out to be the founder of Zeos Computer that later sold to Micron. Hmm. So it was like, <laughs> and now he just he's he sold his share for like I don't know, it was a couple hundred million in '94, and now he Jesus. just like collects. Just, now he just collects trimotor planes. Um, and he's just chilling. That's what I was, yeah, no, but he's super nice, super <laughs> nice guy. Um, and he uh, he had the idea that we should have a consumer offering. And so it was, it was a bit of a pivot, but I thought, well, since we wrote this whole thing in Action Script, it won't be hard to take the Air app and put it online. But when we pivoted, we didn't pivot quite far enough, so we didn't have a really solid pro app anymore. But we, but our consumer app was too complicated for consumers. 
Mm. But one of the things that did come out of that was a whole print pipeline with e-commerce. So when, once you made a mosaic, you could save it to a gallery, and then from that gallery, order prints right to your door anywhere wow. in the world. So we, had, we have prints and canvases and posters that could be shipped anywhere. Wow. That's Crazy. really cool. Yeah, and um, I think in the end we only had about 700 users. It was just it was a marketing challenge. I don't I don't think the tech was weak. I think the marketing was weak. Yeah. And so that yeah. it kind of going back to the well on that. I'm doubling down on Pro since it's the easiest thing to build. And if you get into the Mac App Store, you've got a, a better distribution platform. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is with with wedding season coming up, it'd be pretty easy to just give some demos to pro photographers to try this out and start start blogging about it and, and get the word out that way. Yeah, I'll start, yeah. One, start catching like wildfire all the photography blogs. Yeah, one thing I did do though, um, the a uh, couple weeks ago, I I had the idea of seeing if this worked with video. So people have always been asking me if it can work with video, and I, I was never sure. So I did a test, and it, <laughs> wow. it works. Yeah, my boy is crazy. <laughs> so, so this is a video file, but but um, I should I wish I had a live version of this. This can be a live uh, web, and if you're on iTunes, feed. if you're on iTunes, he's cheating because it's it's actually him in snow, and <laughs> something tells me it's not too hard to mosaic snow. No, well, I'll get you a new. I'll get you a new example. Oh, um, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. the gauntlet has been thrown. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 example. yeah, yeah mosaic video. Show me something cool, Carlos. Sorry, I'm, I'm I'm hearing some little distortion. Um, we got it. You got you're all good. Okay. Um, yeah, but anyway, so that that can be uh, that can work with a Connect video. It can work with webcam. It can work with a video file. It's it's all real time rendering. And I, I did a couple of tests after that, where um, the the image inside the cell changed if there was if the color difference was enough. So each one of those cells is getting a new color value 30, 30 times a second. And so you could you can actually set a tolerance on that. And I, I built it so that if you wave your arm across, if that color difference is enough, it'll change those cells. So you're actually kind of wiping new photos on with your hand uh, if it's on like a webcam, for example. Oh my god! Um, and Adam, you said this works with the Connect. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's going to um, in in principle, it's going to work with any RGB image that you give it. But yeah. what I want to do with the Connect is I want to add. Um, like gestures to it. Gestures and, in depth, yeah. Yeah, and kind of like a genie effect. Actually, let me pull up the very first prototype of this that I did. Because uh, we use another version. Well, it's not the, we use a connect. We've used stuff like that with the connect with like uh, painting light and, and particles using from like uh, a program called Touch Designer. But like uh, we also use Intel RealSense, which is kind of like their version of a connect in the depth. Depth map, map yeah. camera or whatever, and I'm wondering like that would be kind of, you know, interesting. I, yeah, I think a lot you can do with it. And and um, what I what I'm showing right now is the actual very 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 first prototype I built. I built this in about two hours, but this shows kind of a genie effect if you move your mouse around the tiles. Yeah. Um, and so what I want, what I thought would be cool with the connect is if instead of looking at the the X Y of the mouse. If you were looking at the, at the, X, the X, Y of anybody's hands that are in the scene, and so you've kind of got this almost like your hands become this like magnifying power used with the force or something to, mm -hmm. to kind of wherever you move your hand, it, it, it enlarges everything. So that's that's kind of where that's at. Um, right, right now there's right now we 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 had some interest to uh, to port this for a client project to port this to HTML5. So if that goes through, I'll, I'll be able to try to get this working in HTML5, um, which I've been which I've been wanting to do for a couple of years, but it's flat. There's a lot of blend, color blending things that just flat out don't work in IE. So hmm. that's that's kind of been the hesitation. But really, any modern browser HTML5 should be able to handle it. That's awesome. That is pretty sick. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, actually, with with the mosaic, I'll show one. Actually, um, La Mer, they're a global skincare company owned by Estee Lauder. They used it for this uh, for this global campaign, their Eyes Light Up campaign. Oh, cool. What you would, what you would do is we we made a really, really, really simplified version of this. 
where you just choose your main image, choose your tiles, and then I actually built this um, presets feature that the original did not have. So if you just wanted to, in the Instagram age that we live in, people were a lot easier to just click on a look that they like, yeah, and then start with there. But if but, but if you clicked on a look on the right, it would move the sliders on the left, so you could actually see what was happening color wise, and then you then you'd learn enough. Oh, okay, if I change this, yeah. this is what happens. So um, this is kind of a deconstruction of the images. This thing works with not a lot of images. People have only got um, this example with me and Katie is just nine images. And then it goes into that mosaic. And then um, this is an Air Mobile app that it became ultimately. And so this was distributed in the App Store and uh, the Google Play Store. That's really awesome. Cool. And then this, oh, and the other, the other trick with this is it was in uh, 12 languages, which was... Who did the localization? Bad. Uh, well, I did. Oh. He yeah. speaks 13 languages. <laughs> they, Estee Lauder provided the, <laughs> they, they provided a spreadsheet of all the languages, but I wrote, I wrote the architecture to, to actually get them into the app. Yeah. Um, and then you, have, you also have the, the issue of embedding fonts, where like Chinese, for example, has 26 right. characters that you can't embed, so you had to write, I had to write logic to, to whether or not to embed fonts based on what the language was. So it was like um, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese we couldn't embed because the character sets were just too big. Ah, oh, craziness. I think I think Cyrillic might have been part of that too. I, I know there was a Russian version that was in Cyrillic, which was pretty crazy. Actually, I thought I had I thought I had the languages in here. Maybe I don't. Maybe that was, that was somewhere else. But yeah, that's that's the story of Mosaic. I hope uh, I think this could be the year that it comes back to life and hopefully does better. Well, I think you have a really good perspective now because um, you've seen it be successful and then it's gone dormant, but then now you're you're introducing the social aspect of it or the, the super quick touch and go uh, uh, functionality that you're adding to it. I think it I think it's uh, that's going to help. Yeah, for sure. Um, is there anything else you want, or should I can I stop screen sharing? Uh, is there anything else you want to show? Uh, let's take a look. Um, oh, I like this project. Uh, about five years, five years ago, almost six years ago, um, another out of home project in Times Square, where this was Flash running in a browser on a fifty foot billboard in Times Square, which is pretty fun. <laughs> so. This this app this is the old Virgin Mega Store in Times Square that became a Forever Twenty One, um, and so I wrote this I wrote this countdown app that counted down for like three weeks to the actual minute that the that the store opened, so it was just this big countdown numbers and there was this like kind of behind the scenes video running behind it, um, and then we uh, we we tapped into the store's sound system to do this this animation over the door. Yeah. So we had. It was it was it was funny because I was in the Dominican Republic like the week before for a wedding and I, I asked the the company I was with Space 150 at the time I was like hey do you need me in New York and they're like no no we think we got it and then of course I'm sitting in the airport in the Dominican Republic and they want to have me fly straight to New York from there <laughs> I was like no I have a suitcase full of sweaty island clothes let me go home for a night and then I'll go to New York so <laughs> so after all that I get to New York and I'm I'm they're, they're like hey that that fascia above the door we forgot about that so I in a day I wrote this music visualizer it was just me and a me and a designer and, the, and he was working on some after effects stuff in a, in a hotel suite and I was just doing different like audio tricks um, so we had a, we had a union electrician run um, run a cable from the store's sound system into the audio in on the server back in the server room. That gave us the the music pulse that we need. And then this is just kind of a, a particle emitter that's controlled by that music pulse. So it's just a, a really quick uh, one day thing. Actually, I think I have video of that running. Let me see if I can find that. How much did that union guy cost? Nah, I don't know. I <laughs> cost more than <laughs> cost more than the project. Yeah. All right. 60 videos. Yeah, this is a while back. Um, but yeah, the, the, we spent so much, so many overnights in that store. It's, it's one of those projects that you, you're just exhausted during it, but then at the end you're like, oh, it wasn't so bad. So I think, yeah, here's my, my one-day visualizer. So there you can see it running. Um, 
yeah, this was probably, I don't even know what time of day that was, probably 5 in the morning or something. Jeez. Awesome. But, uh, yeah, the, and this, this was my first taste of, like, doing this kind of work but not as part of a website, and it's it's a... It's got a new set of problems with it, but I think it was so it, it was it's so cool to see your work that big, um, yeah. all lit up like that. And it's it just really it was kind of a rush. That's why that all star project was really fun too, where it's like, you know, I, I took over a whole floor of a building, um, and just and just doing some animation stuff. Yeah, the installation stuff is fun. It's exactly the type of stuff my company works. Oh, does, nice. uh, that I work for, yeah. Um, Did I? And they just finished something for the NBA store, the new NBA store in New York, in New York City. Oh, cool. Um, that was the same type of deal. Was like um, visualizing, just bringing in all different types of like stats up to date, yeah. live, and but it, all the screens, everything is larger than life, so it's always cool. Yeah, this um, this light up the night thing was actually a pro bono project I did that uh, I had done this holiday experience the year before where you could build um, like a 3D star and then share it with somebody. And so this, this, this arts and healing program fundraiser was um, wanted to option that because their theme was Starry Night. And they were raising money for um, the Children's Hospital here in Minneapolis. They, they do these art boxes mm -hmm. where it's like the kids can color or you know make stuff out of paper or whatever they want. And it's, it's been proven to help them heal and just keep their morale up. But insurance companies won't pay for that, oh. and so because it, you know you can't, it's not a medical line item to them. So, so this program raised a quarter million dollars in this one night to to pay for all these programs at the hospital. So this was um so I, I took what was a web app and turned it into a, a just a simple kiosk, and these are some of the screens where you could go through and choose choose your level. We, we were selling these stars, so the more money you spent, the more features you unlocked. Oh, wow. and, then, uh, and then you had all these wow. controls to do this 3D star, and then so it's like uh, Candy Crush. Yeah, and then um, then that was projected into the into the main ballroom during dinner on these. On the, I think it was like a 24 foot screen, um, and then it would say like who the donors were and who they were donating it to. And then we took all of that data and brought it to the hospital as in the form of a Connect app that I modified a little bit. So if the the kids' hands became like particle emitters on the screen. Yeah. And then, um, if they clap their hands together, it would ex it would open up one of the donator donor created stars. Oh wow! Mm. And so the the staff had a had a good time with it too. Um, the the only problem, and this this is, you know, anytime you're doing an installation, you don't always have control over lighting. So this right this was kind yeah. of a disappointment because it was in this main hallway right under a light. So that's why the screen looks so washed out. There's yeah. nothing we could do about that. But it was still still really good uh, experience just doing, you know, a, a web project to a kiosk project to a display to a Connect app. There was there was a lot of code in this thing. And what was the video at the bottom? Oh, um, that was just the the production reel of just some of the some of the prototypes. I could probably run that quick. So this was, I think this was to show the board the progress that we had. So this is, uh, my friend Steve did all the interface design stuff, and I, um, I did all the coding. I think I have some um, connect tests in here too. So while you're scrubbing through there. How do you think your creativity fits into all of this technology that you're creating? Well, I, I, I think uh, for me, I, for me, it kind of started at birth. My, my mom's a, a really talented artist, and my dad's more of an engineering mind. So, oh, well. <laughs> I, I think for I think you got, you got blessed with both. Yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. So thank um, God you turned out to be the good twin. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna stop sharing for for a minute. Yeah, um, so so I think I think for me that that blend of art and science has always been there. So like Lego is our great example too, where it's like, hey, I got to think up this thing, this creative thing to do, but then you have to have the the engineering chops to execute on it. And so I, I think with with what I do, it's the, it, I, I, I like the design process. I like the creative process. And so to be a developer, I think you have to try extra hard to not lose that. 
because developers, it's so easy to just get labeled, oh, you're just production. Just here's a PSD, go make this. And yeah. so it's, it's really important to always be an advocate of making something better. And go, going to MCAD helped me communicate with creatives because they, at least I hope, for, for a lot of my career, they haven't seen me as just production because I'm not, I'm not there to say no. A lot of developers see something like, no, we can't do that. They say I'm no always all the about, time. This yeah, sucks. and and so I'm all I'm always about um, you know really not Sorry. losing sight of the creative goal and the business goal. Like usually, if I know right. what those parameters are, I can say, oh, like oh, we can't do that, but I know what you're trying to do. How about we do it this way? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's not about whether you can or can't. Like technically, sometimes whether it's whether you can or can't timeline or budget wise. You know, it's like hey, we can totally do that, but this is we have a week, not a month. Right. So that, that shapes your scope. And so I think I think there's other ways of being creative versus just the visual part. It's creatively coming at a problem. Right. And um, so that, that's kind of how I, how I try to leverage that. Mm -hmm. That's how it was described to me when I started getting into development. Um, and it, it's a lot like what you just described where with a with a traditional developer, a lot of things are true and false, black and white, and that's it. Either we can do it or we can't. Versus, um, you know, a more creative person might just take a look at it and say, I don't know right now, Yeah. but I'm sure there's a way to do it if we have enough time. Just tell or, me maybe. Yeah. I'll be yeah. Or, or tell me, or, or usually what I'll say is, like, let me sleep on it because... That happens all the time. It happened with this uh, Instagram pitch we were working on, where it's like I kind of knew, but I, I thought let me let me incubate this for another day. And the next the next day, I, I had pretty much the solution all figured out. So sometimes you need to step away from a problem, and that's any creative problem, right? Sometimes you just need to step back from it, clear your head, and then come back to it. Yeah, I just gotta stop looking at it for a while. Yeah. And let's and let's take let's go down that road for a second, um, because you do have a creative background and now you're obviously doing a lot of this technical stuff mm -hmm. um, how do you approach a creative problem versus a technolo technological problem um, is your approach the same do you do you feel like walking away and taking a breath is that part of your ramp up period it, it's I, I think it is probably with everything I do it's it's almost like you wanna you want to just get everything out on the table to see what you're dealing with. Just give me all the facts. It's, it's like, a, like a discovery deep dive when you're starting a project. Like, mm -hmm. Let's just get everything in here and then my brain never really stops. I'm sure you guys are the same way. Whether you like creative, Creativity is not a nine to five job. Your brain is always running. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, that's the same with anything. And I think it depends what the nature of the creative problem is. You know, if you're actually thinking up the core idea of a campaign, that's going to be different than if you're just like, oh, I just need a design treatment for this or that. There's a different level of analysis needed there. But, I, but I, th I think it is pretty much the same where it's just like, hey, I need a day to think about what this could be, and then you come back. And then usually at that point, we, um, we try to start prototyping as soon as possible if, if it is a technology thing mm -hmm. to, to prove out a creative idea. Because because to us it's one and the same. Our, our our company's new slogan is "Ideas first, technology second. We're, we're not we're not a tech company that wants to wow you with technology. We're a tech company that wants to wow you with our ability to collaborate and work with, work with the creative process. That was the the hurdle that I always had to jump over when when I would go in, especially as a contractor. You go into a, a company, and a lot of times. Um, they have their set developers and they have their frameworks and all yeah. this stuff. And, uh, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had on-the-job training when it comes to all this programming and developing classes and mm -hmm. singletons and all this other stuff, yeah. right? And so <clears throat> my code might not be the prettiest, even though I do try to... I, I have been complimented on my code, um, uh, but I might not approach it in a way that a traditional, formally trained developer would have done it. Right. Um, but my stuff, like the 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 projects that I delivered, have always been very sexy. They've mm -hmm. always been the animation has always been tight. 
the 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 final experience has always been exactly what my focus has been. I don't give a damn if I you know if I wrote a class in under seventy five lines or not. I don't. That's not what gets me going. What gets me going is when someone clicks on my project and they say, "Ooh, ah," you know. Yeah, and that's and and I think to build on that, my the, my business partner and I are very different in that respect. Because he's very formally trained with like front end standards. Um, and semantic markup. He's a stickler for that, which in a lot of projects you you want that. That that's going to affect your SEO. That's going to mm-hmm. affect how things are structured. But we we butted heads a little bit on Buffalo Trace until I kind of got him to. It was like a matrix moment where I was telling him to free his mind because <laughs> you know at at that point you're not you're not trying to pass a test. You're making art, and it's more about like I don't care if that should be a P tag or an LI tag. Make it a div. I'm going to wire it up with JavaScript, and we're going to move on. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, I mean, so I, did you just I pull think, rank at him? <laughs> yeah. I I think there's a give and take there. You you want things to be yeah. technically proficient, especially if someone else is going to ever visit that code. But yeah, at the end of the day, you're making something for a human that doesn't give a shit. They don't care if it's a if you wrote a factory pattern when you should have wrote a you know a singleton or whatever. Um, right. They want it to work and they want to feel something out of it. And I've always done. I was always trying to experiment while, while building things, right? Um, I was always trying to experiment. How can I do this a little bit, <laughs> a little bit? This is this story just popped in my head. Uh, just a little bit more unique or a little bit easier. You know what I mean? And yeah. so, um, so, <laughs> so I built. So, so that, so the, the Tom Cruise website builds off of XML, right? And it loads all of the images that you're going to need. And so I had this image loader that you would then, it would go grab all the images and hold it, and then you would have to say, hey, image loader, you would have to say, please. (laughs) (laughs) Image, please, and then you tell it what image you want, right? (laughs) And you would know because it's listed in the the XML. And and if you didn't say, please, it wouldn't give it to you. (laughs) That's kind of not many eye. people like that, but I did. You're gonna be polite, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, you're like programming protocol into your code, <laughs> social protocol. <sighs> um, uh, I was gonna ask you your your stance on the the witch hunt that uh, that was happening. Um, that people were coming for Flash's hide. Yeah, what's what's funny about that is I, I think Mashable or somebody just just published something that's like, oh, Flash is officially being killed because like some browser rumored maybe they're going to drop support for it or whatever. And it's like I've been hearing Flash is dying for six years. That's over half of its life. <laughs> yeah, and. You know, it's it's, and I I, can't, I I never comment on like if a Mashable or somebody posts something, but I was like, you know, hey, this has been dying for six years. I hope you got you got all the clicks you wanted because it, it, <laughs> it's, it you know it's just ad dollars now. They're just trying yeah. to sensationalize it. Yeah. But it's, I think it's an unfortunate thing that didn't need to happen, and I think Adobe probably hung on a little too long to that plat to that platform as it currently is. They finally went to Flash Animate and they called it Animate w- what it is. Which is really a modern version of Future Splash, which is what it started out as. Um, but I, I thought, and this goes back to 2007. I never thought Flash should be on phones. When I when I moved to San Francisco, an Adobe recruiter um, hit me up to to work on their mobile platform for, for Adobe, and I actually told them no because I because even then, and this is this was before, you know, the whole witch hunt and everything. I just said I don't think it should be on phones because to me. Flash is about rich, immersive experiences, and you're not going to do that on a three-inch screen no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, other th- the other thing I heard was that uh, that the whole thing started because it was actually a, a, with, like, with the iPad, which is really when it became prevalent. Um, yeah. I, was, I was hearing that there was like a former Apple engineer that said the truth of the matter was they couldn't get Flash to run on that, on that processor. Right. And so yeah. they turned that limitation into a feature... Of open web, yeah. of, you know, that, that, you know, they kind of reframed it a little bit, um, and that just bothered me because you had you had Steve Jobs, 
saying, oh, Flash is bad, but web stand open web standards are good. And then you'd go to Apple, Apple.com, and you'd be watching all the videos in their proprietary QuickTime player. Yeah. And I was like, guys, yeah, like, come yeah. on. And it was just, it was really, it was just really frustrating the, the way it went down. And Adobe was, I don't think Adobe handled it really well, and I think Apple just went too hard on it. But then you had all these fanboys that were like, probably never coded Flash in their life or were bad at it. And they're like, oh, Flash is bad, bad now. Cool, I can hate on Flash because I sucked at it because I never had learned to code actual object-oriented stuff. Right. <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm over. I'm over generalizing stuff, but you know. No, I'm, not really. I've, no. I've seen a lot of like like JavaScript's a great example, right? You, it, for all the things it can do, it's a dirty freaking language. Yeah, it's. I agree. It, it's, it's a little on the sloppy side. It's untyped. You, it's the wild west. It's it's you can you can get away with a lot of terrible things in JavaScript or just hacking scripts together versus actually writing a program. Um. And the other thing I don't think Flash gets credit for is inspiring an entire generation of web developers and designers. Right. Because when... Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. You know, in, in the early 2000s, you had... You still had Netscape around, which is a pain in the ass. You had all these different browsers <laughs> to solve for. Um, yeah, Porsche, Porsche was on Netscape... 4.7 until at least 2007 or 8. It was a disaster. Wow. But um, craziness. But but I think like like J Joshua Davis is a great example where all this Amazing. generative art he was doing and things like that. And this was 10 years ago, <laughs> and I'm seeing all these Chrome quote unquote experiments where the same people that were saying, oh, I shouldn't need to d download a plugin to see something, are now asking you to download an entire browser to see something. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just uh, very good point. And I mean, yeah. I mean, think about it, because Apple had has Safari. Mm -hmm. Chrome was talking about blocking the plugin. They're the first browser to block the plugin. Well, I thought it was Mozilla. That was Firefox. It was oh, was it? Yeah, it was yeah. Mozilla. Yeah, Chrome. But 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 you're. But I think Carlos, what you're thinking of is um, Apple was going to not install it by default with new Macs. Like the Flash Player wasn't going to become pre-installed with Safari. I think is what yeah. it was. Yeah. But I, you know, I think. What I the example I always use too is is YouTube. YouTube came out in what oh four oh five. Yeah. That would have never oh, happened back then if it wasn't for Flash. What are we gonna do? Download Real Player for all that shit? Like and Hulu uh, too. Hulu yeah. In the same way. I mean, even uh, Netflix started that way, and then they quickly Netflix? switched to that uh, Vimeo, their, their proprietary player. Yeah, and so I think I think if you look at the the technology and platforms that that came because of Flash years ahead of its time. Yeah. I, I, I still see HTML stuff all the time where people are bragging, like, oh, my gosh, look at what we did in HTML. I'm like, yeah, I did that 10 years ago in Flash. Yeah, yeah that's what I noticed. Like, when it, when it was first, like, the big hype about HTML5, I was going to these sites that were like, look what you can do in HTML5. And it was the first thing I was like, I've seen this all, like, 10 years ago. <laughs> I think that's kind of like, that's what was really cool about Flash is it, it totally revolutionized the way people were thinking about what the internet can do. Because before then, it was like, you know, you had a bright, cool site if it was, like, flashing colors and, like, alternating, yeah. you know. It was like, it just, Awful. you were so limited. And, like, Flash came, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, wow, there's actually, like, a purpose to the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, like, it really was the iPhone of the internet plugins. Right. Well, and it, and it changed it changed the, the quality of developers coming out of schools, too. Oh, totally. I, I had this with two different people um, uh, at an agency I worked at, they're noticing that like when you when you hired a Flash developer, they had an inherent sense of motion, and they yeah, had an inherent right. sense of design. Whereas now, with with the web standards, you've got people that need to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, kind of all as one. That's kind of one concept, is how we think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but they're so in the code that they're not they don't understand polishing a user interface. Right. And, and, and I think that piece has gotten lost. And now, especially with the demand, schools are trying to turn these kids out so fast that they're not. These kids aren't understanding like just, just that, that how much spend an extra hour on little transitions or little rollovers or something that in Flash was just was just part of what you did. Right. And, so, and, I, and I think that's that's kind of sad that it's it's that that part has gotten lost, but. There was a I I jumped in on a project for Randy Travis, and uh, it, 
they were using I forget ah, I forget the name of the framework, but it was basically it was handling all of the calls and all of the you know it would shut down the event listeners and everything. Oh, okay. It's this whole framework that that handled all of that, and the 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 back end of the app just the app not the database part but the, like the code part was really cool i mean it was it worked and everything was fine but the 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 thing was when you click a button it just like flipped from one page to the next oh <laughs> and i was and i was thinking to myself the, all the hubbub of this this um this framework, and that's the shit that you're going to develop. Yeah, I'd rather do it by myself and be able to control. You know, the, I always approach things. I'm going to tell stories by the way things move from one screen to the next. Right. You click on something, you fill something out. Something interesting is going to happen. But if you're going to flip yeah. from one page yeah. to the next, do uh, that in HTML and call it a day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally, it, cause, and that's something I used to do a lot, too, is you, you establish a motion language throughout a site. So if I did a lot of Adidas work when I was in California, and you can have so much fun with those, with those transitions that really keep you in that, in that state of mind. Yeah. Um, but I, I, think, I think HTML5 is getting there depending on how you do it. Yeah. Um, our, our new, the new company site we're working on does a really smooth fade-out, fade-in, even though... It, it's changing views in HTML, so it's 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 pretty. It's just a it's a such a it's eight lines of JavaScript is all it is, yeah. but uh, it it's, it seems to add quite a bit. Uh, and then going back to because um, you touched on a couple points, and I, and I had an idea that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, the demise of Flash, we kind of did it to ourselves. As Flash developers, we did it to ourselves. Why do you say um, that? Because in the beginning, it was future splash, and then it turned into flash, and it was an animation tool, right? Right. That wasn't good enough. We wanted to have dynamic text fields. Oh, yeah. That wasn't good enough. Oh. Then we needed to connect it to a database. That wasn't good enough. Now we want to send passwords and do all kinds of things. And uh, I don't know, Adam, were you a part of the, the Marlboro team when we, when we were working um, at Marlboro.com? No, I, well, not part of the dot com. I, I was part of the Philip Morris team, but not Marlboro specifically. Okay. Yeah, because that website was absolutely brilliant, and we were. I mean, but not having a website wasn't enough. We wanted to go and play. We were playing pool. You walked into one of the rooms. You could play pool and change the music on the jukebox. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I mean, isn't that kind you of like a pack? Isn't that kind of like a pattern with Adobe software in general? I mean, they just get so huge, and they're just adding and adding and adding and adding. And, and that's and that's I mean, True. That, that Marlboro website is was absolutely amazing, and what the web should have become if you were if that's what you wanted. You know what I mean? The, it was a truly immersive website that was. I mean, I I built one section that. Um, that you can go in and flip through uh, a cookbook, and then it would give you different recipes and stuff, right? So uh, that's that's where the web should should be. Um, but then what happened is all these banner ad people got their hands on Flash, and then and everybody started, started making banners. And then we started making banner ads. And Dude. then it wasn't good enough that we had just one banner ad on a web page. We needed 30. And then all 30 of those banner ads started playing their own music and wow. started crashing browsers and started transferring information back and forth to see how long you're at that web page and all this stuff. And that's yeah. what... like, Because if you ask anyone about Flash... The majority of the people are going to say the banner ads were what drove me crazy. Yeah, that makes sense. The majority. Because yeah. if, if you built a website the proper way in Flash and kind of like what, Adam, what you were saying, if you, if you learned how to code in the right way, it's going to be a really cool experience. Banners yeah. is kind of like the mail that you get in the mailbox and you just flip it in the trash because you know you're not going to buy a new gate. You know yeah. you don't need your grass cut. 
Yeah. No, you don't need a plumber right now. <laughs> you don't need all them damn coupons. You know what I mean? Mm. So those are, that's what banner ads are. So now that banner ads have crashed the Flash industry, now we're back to Flash being an animation tool and the circle is complete. <laughs> right, right. Circle of life. And, and now it's HTML5 banners crashing uh, browsers. Exactly. Because, exactly. And, and, I've, and I've been saying this since for the last six years, you can, you can code shitty in any language. That's not specific to Flash. <laughs> yeah. You can have a memory leak in JavaScript. You can have a memory leak anywhere. Yeah. Mm. I'm writing that down because I kind of like that. You can code shitty in any language. Yep. Take your pick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, the world is yours. <laughs> <laughs> So the other day, uh, you reached out to me, and, uh, and you, you said, hey, have you seen this documentary? Oh, yeah. The documentary is uh, Indie Game. If you go to IndieGameTheMovie.com, uh, the story is the about movie? a couple. Yeah, IndieGameTheMovie.com. And it's a documentary about <clears throat> a couple independent game developers. One one guy is doing the whole entire thing by himself and then the other the other game is being made by a developer and an and an artist. And uh, uh, and you asked me if I had seen it and this I found this movie when I was making my first game um, and and I watched it and I think I had it on loop. Because building games by yourself sucks. <laughs> <laughs> because you're doing the programming, you're doing the animation, you're doing the interface, you're doing absolutely everything, and no one says hi. No one. <laughs> it's no like a one. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I've seen it a, a handful of times. Uh, what did you think about it? I. It was it was kind of funny. It was it was like really, it was inspiring, but also depressing at the same time because I could relate to all of their frustrations. <laughs> so it's kind of like it's like oh my gosh, we are us. It was just this weird like meta kind of moment. Um, but but there is that danger, and we touched on this earlier in the broadcast of that danger of doing too much. Yeah. Or, or think you know not reaching out for to to delegate some things some things out. Um, but in terms of that, that single-minded, like, all-in, forget friends and family, forget eating, gain 20 pounds, I, that was my whole last year. And, <laughs> and so I wasn't doing a game. I was forming Way to hang in there, Katie. <laughs> well, she, she went to bed. Oh. But, um, but it, you know, and it's, it's kind of sad because it's like, oh, my gosh, why are, we, why are we pushing ourselves so hard? But it's ultimately for the passion of what we do. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, I, I I'll probably I'll probably buy it too. I just rented it on uh, on Apple TV, but I'll probably buy it just to, like you said, just have it on a loop when I'm when I'm working late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> have you ever wanted to get into game development? All the yes, yes, for years. Um, but I was not allowed to have a Nintendo growing up. My parents thought it would. I don't know what they thought, but um. But I did. I was. I could have role playing games like Indiana Jones, problem solving type stuff. Um, <laughs> so what you have that digital version of it. <laughs> yeah, but in, and so then in two thousand eight, when, when I was out in California and I was at Best Buy, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to buy an Xbox today just oh, because I could. Great. So um, then I wasted all my <laughs> then I just wasted all my time playing Call of Duty. And now you understand why your parents kept you away from it because that was me too. I played yeah. the hell out of Call of Duty. Yeah, it was. That's a yeah, that's a game. But I think you know, I I think gaming is. It's like it's like, it is to a programmer what a decathlon is to a to an athlete, because it's mm -hmm. you're you're coding, you're doing sound design, you're doing three D, you're doing game art, you're doing scorekeeping, you're doing if if it's a multiplayer game or online game, you're doing the whole data layer, you're doing the whole server layer. Um, it's there's physics usually. It's, it's. I think it's the hardest thing a programmer can do. Um, so I'm, I'm. I'm slowly but surely getting into Unity and doing some of the Unity engine stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Carlos, did I tell you about that? Uh, 
that pitch in New York for that like shoppable Sim City kind of virtual city thing? I think you started to. Yeah, we're we're, we're pitching on this uh, this big company in Pennsylvania that makes like pipe fittings, and they wanted a really cool sales tool for their for their field team to to show like. A, like a city, and you click on the type of building you want to make. So if, oh, I'm building a stadium, okay, let's click on the stadium and look at an X-ray expanded view of the stadium. Then you can go room by room and look at their fittings. And there's X-ray views, there's animation, there's, it's... it's, it's, it's oh, dude, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> pretty, I mean, That's all I'm going to say. They want it <laughs> languages and a CMS and everything else, um, but it sounds like we're close to getting it, so... Are you gonna like, use Unity? Awesome. That's that's the plan uh, right now. Um, the the agency in New York's gonna do all the 3D work, and then I'm gonna be putting everything together in Unity. So it might might be hitting you up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me know. Uh, you were talking about how your parents are trying to keep you away from games. I used to work with this guy who was never allowed to play games unless he built his own game. Oh. <laughs> wow. That's kind of so, awesome. So he would spend awesome. all this time. And then the thing is, the thing is, it's cool when you're a kid, but then when you're my boss and you're trying to tell me that, uh, you know, what was it? He would say, no, you're not allowed to do that until you build such and such and such. I'm like, bitch, you're not my real dad. Get out of here. <laughs> you're not <laughs> my real dad. <laughs> yeah, he, I, yeah, he he did he he would make me do things like he came in on a Monday morning, I'm not kidding you. He came in on a Monday morning and he put down a computer and he goes, You need to set this up for lamp. And then when that's done install some browsers, and then develop, blah, blah, blah. So when people say, oh, yeah, I built this from the ground up. I built this website from the ground up. I built that bitch from the ground up. <laughs> like, from, from here's a box with a hard drive in it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I'm like, what? It, I know you have issues, kid, but I'm not, no. We're not doing this. He, one day he just said, stop. <laughs> We're yeah. not doing this anymore. What are you doing? I'd probably have developed a game by now if I had ideas. I just don't have ideas. And it's um, a friend of mine that has a studio here in the neighborhood. She uh, she she has this, like, 2D generative art idea that we might make into, like, some kind of... I don't know how you gamify that, but she wants to do some kind of iPad thing. So we want to collaborate on that just so I can kind of dip my toe in the water for some kind of gaming app. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Uh, oh, I was going to say something about that. Oh, have you seen that one game? Charlie, what's it called? That 2D Popeye looking one? Cuphead. Oh, Cuphead. 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 Cuphead was done in Unity. So cup, think of uh, old school Popeye or, you know, any that old style. school. That style. Any old school Max 2D Max animation style. cartoon, right? Okay. Totally done with sprites in Unity. Um, all hand drawn, and then use they wow. use Unity for it, and, and not even see Cintiq. it. Not even Cintiq. They're drawing on paper. Here, let's on paper. Jack, you got a link? Yeah, let's give them a link, because people think it's all hand drawn and not really even done in Unity. But yeah, they they have a they have a bunch of artists that are doing all the animation, like Charlie said, hand drawn. Then they scan it. Meanwhile, they have developers who are. Pack it down into sprites, them. sprites, and then you know. Yeah, and then. Uh, Here, yeah, the chat it's for supposed you. to be coming out sometime this year, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. This is a cool time of the year where stuff comes out in the next couple of months. Quarter one for games are always when they usually come out, or when they get pushed back. <laughs> so we'll <laughs> we'll see if it comes out. But so it's called CupheadGame.com. Heartbreak. You know. CupheadGame.com. Cuphead game. And if you like Unity, I know Unity, um, uh, our base oh. engine right now at the studio is Unity for a lot of our stuff mm -hmm. because all of our programmers like to write in C Sharp or whatever. Oh, yeah. and, but uh, we also do Unreal. Since I've came on, we've brought, brought Unreal. I kind of showed them the way, and now we have one programmer that uh, 
dabbles in mm -hmm. Unreal and knows and knows uh, C plus plus. So we're starting to do projects with that too. So we're doing back and forth. So we like Omni, um, but we do a lot of that stuff based for installation based stuff or companies showing stuff off and branding. So you, how do you make a game or something that you would normally do using motion graphics but using an engine uh, engine instead? Um, so. Right, right. So yeah, I, I I've heard many of great things about Unity, and I've used it on three or four projects now, and it's cool. It's cool, but I definitely see where uh, programmers like it. Um, yeah. Based on based on the easy use, it has a great community and great backend in terms of like just the breadth of like content for for for, for programmers, you know, as well, well as I, mean, a, I think that use. I think what you're saying there, uh, Charlie is. Uh, is key because if you guys remember the beginning of Flash, the community was what made it so popular. The community yeah. was absolutely yeah. all in. And I feel like it's almost like that personality has shifted over to the Unity community. There's a lot of people there that are, you know, they're showcasing work and they're sharing code and this is how I did this. and Yeah, I... I think I think you're right that um, and that's one of the, the reasons why we're slowly using the Unreal um, uh, engine with stuff and I've done a couple of demos and got the uh, owner on board with a lot of different things we were, sh were showing stuff off but they're slowly building that like marketplace and community with Unreal. I mean Unreal has a great great base already but not it's a little bit different for if you talk to a programmer that likes to program with C sharp and can go to different websites or can go to different like uh, What's the uh, programming uh, sites like um, where you can grab code or read case studies and stuff like that? Um, uh, Stack Overflow is. I don't know if that's what you're thinking. Overflow is the one I was thinking. That's great. Yeah, well, what's the other one where it's like uh, I can't think of it right now. But anyway, uh, there's just a lot of this is just a lot of information, especially if you get into like installation-based stuff, where people are using Unity with crazy things like you know generating lights that sequence for uh, for a concert or something like that oh, or, yeah. or guys that works work on Bono concerts and that that like are displaying stuff on crazy screens and stuff like that that are hooking in with other programs that you don't even think why would you be using an engine for that you know it's it's a very interesting network of of developers and and the company's doing pretty good although for the artistic thing cuz I do more on the artistic side I would like them to keep staying on 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 a par with with Unreal and the industry stuff, a lot of times you see stuff with Unity where it's like, oh, it looks amazing, but then when they come out with the, oh, okay, this is how we did it. Oh, well, this was a custom script for this, or this was oh, a custom, yeah. you know, custom or this is a custom thing for this. I'm like, ah, so it's not really it. So, but you're, you know, advertising it to everybody that like, yo, we're we're keeping up with Epic, you know, because we have all these cool things, or our lighting is like this, or you can use Unity for architectural rendering. When I mean, you really you can if you have your have a good programming department or you have those good um, custom scripts. So, but they're slowly doing great job, stuff with that. I mean, they're, they're they're coming along really good with that. So they do a good job. It's constantly being updated every month, which is the nice thing about engines and you know we want them to do software like that a little bit more too, which they're trying to do right. You know that whole like you should be updating this like we shouldn't have to wait once a year. We should be getting now that I see like all these engines and. Stuff like that, and other programs, you know, uh, 3D printing programs and stuff like that, like that are getting literally updated monthly. Where I get tired of hitting the update button when I run the program, you know. <laughs> um, why can't we get all the other programs to be on the same thing? I don't want to wait a year for the next, you know, Autodesk product or Maxon product, product or whatever insert your product there. You should be giving me an update. <laughs> you get paid to work 40 hours a week. Let's get an update in like a month and a half, you know. <laughs> you know, for, for new features, but, you know, so. So we were talking about um, the community that's starting to build up behind Unity. Mm -hmm. um, and earlier we were talking about building your own network or your own community and not being afraid to go from school into corporate America to build those relationships. And we wanted to circle back and talk about that. Or that said uh, studio or whatever you know, yeah, yeah. Right. Just get out there and and get your get your feet wet, or is, is it get your feet wet or get your hands dirty, or both? Both. It's actually both. Both. Yes, both. Um, 
<laughs> so go out there, get your feet wet, and get your hands oh. dirty. Um, um, but we are going to come back and touch touch on that topic. Um, how important is it to get out there and, and build these relationships? I I think it's huge, um, especially since if if it's you don't you don't want to work in a vacuum, and I and I think that and that never changes. This isn't this isn't specific to coming out of school. You you don't want to think oh I you know if 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 you can only see you know ten percent of the entire industry, you think oh okay I'm 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 really good. Well you're only seeing ten percent of that. You see another twenty, like oh wait maybe I'm shit. Maybe I can learn from these people. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I've always always tried to approach it. Where it's like I you know you know that saying if if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. Right. <laughs> I, 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 tr- I try to live by that, and I and I think that professional network, not and not and not just for what, what you do in your chosen discipline. I've 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 made friends with account directors and producers and creatives, and that network has has allowed me to get my business as far as we have because, so far, a hundred percent of our referrals are coming from, or I'm sorry, a hundred percent of our business are coming from referrals. People I've worked with in the past, or people who know people, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, but it's just you just never know, you know, who you might work with in the future, whether whether or not they're even in your same industry. Yeah, I think it's I think it's good. Um, I've always had the notion of wanting to work at the best place to start off, you know, mm-hmm. and not necessarily start off in freelance. Um, one of my things, even coming out of school, one of my things was. I was always afraid of um, not working on really good high-end work, you know, yeah. and settling for, uh, I won't call it mediocre, but work that you only do by yourself if you don't know what you're doing, but you get through it, right? I, right. I, don't, I don't really like that notion of doing that things. And I always thought that if I'm going to ever have my own business or anything like that one day, I need to have the experience that goes along with it and not the experience of running the business because that's I feel like that's separate but the experience of knowing how to do the business if that makes sense in terms of the work based right. off of people teaching you right I like that whole artist mentor type deal mm-hmm. I need to be the shittiest person in the room like you said yep, right yep. Um, my first job was at EA so I was literally the shittiest person in the room because it was, <laughs> I was fresh out of college but everybody else there and the team they put me on uh, had a good six years on me. So I literally was a new guy. I, I, I did all the hazing and all the, like, hounding of, like, being the slowest or whatever. But that made me, made me that much better, right? Because yeah. years after I left that, even when I went on different I- interviews, um, I still had a lot of the stuff that I used to do at EA on my website. But they would look, overlook you know, being at other places for five, six years and go back to that stuff. I'm like, oh, this is really nice. This is really good. And I think that speaks to something, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it would flabbergast me that I'd be talking to, you know, the Tomb Raider guys or something like that in an interview, and then, like, they look at something that was, like, six years ago, and in my head it was like, that's not even relevant. Why are you looking at that? Modeling is even, it's changed. <laughs> Texturing has changed. It's not – it's – it's starting to look dated. I should have took that off. You know how you, all the things you think about in an interview. Yeah. But they spend a half an hour on that stuff <laughs> and, and ask more questions. So I always feel like work at as many different places as you can. And you meet people, like you said, that, and yeah. you and Carlos were saying, you meet people, and that's like, I feel that's better. Like all those contexts you get, you know, uh, in the future. And you just become better than like having to do it all yourself, which I, I, I get that some artists do that. But that's kind of what I wanted to get you guys' take on that part. Like, I get understand, like, pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, starting your business. There's a lot of people have done that and been successful, but there has to be something said to, to be mentored and curated for years and then, and then come out, you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think, I, I think that mentor thing is, um, is important. Because you're going to run into a challenge that it's going to take you much longer to to jump that hurdle than if, say, you're working with someone that has been doing it for, kind of like you said, for six years. And then they'd be able to say, 
you know, don't don't really do that because they're not looking for that, or this is a better way to do that that's a little more efficient, rather than having to go to these websites and YouTube to see what strangers are doing. You just look over to the person that's been there for six years and you ask them. Right. So your ramp up to becoming a badass, that ramp is comes a lot faster mm -hmm. than if you're trying to muscle through and do it all by yourself. Um, and again, you know, you you show up at a place, you work hard, do a good job, good things are going to happen for you. Yeah. You know, we're going back to Adam got a call the day after he opened his office from a company in New York, from some girl that he worked with in Chicago. Like, how random is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. I'd feel, I li and I liked how you did it, Adam, because I... Inside, I would feel personally, and I can't speak for anybody else, but personally, I would feel a little like a hack if if I had if I'm trying, and then if I have people underneath me, like say, say I had my own business, mm -hmm. but I know that I'm like figuring it out as I go instead of being that dude that kind of knows what he's doing or has the experience. I don't I don't know how to explain it, but um, no, and I think I think people can usually tell. They can yeah. tell like when their supervisor or the owner of their company like has no clue what they're doing. Like yeah. they just did this because maybe they didn't know how to do anything else, or you know, they, they couldn't get a job at a real place, or it's and almost like. A... Oh, go ahead, sorry. It's almost kind of like you know, starting your own business is something you work towards. It's not like your first your first reaction, especially in the creative industry. It's because like, there's so many methodologies and ways of doing things, and there's already so many lab tested, you know, things, you know, that companies have tried and failed and it's like if you just go into a blind, you're just like erasing all these years of history that that you yeah. are there for you to learn yeah. from, you know? And it's like you're if you go on the and it's cool that stuff's free and available online and you can teach yourself and this country has like a rabid obsession with self made men and like teaching yourself and doing all which is cool, but you can take it to an extreme and it's like you're missing that immediate feedback loop. It's like, yeah, I can watch something on YouTube and learn it, but there's no opportunity for right. me to say, stop it and say, hey, but why did you do that? Or could you do it this way? And then there's this kind of like back and forth between you and your mentor or your coworker. And something important to remember too is all those self-made men or people, uh, chances are they had some sort of a mentor. They had a life yeah. coach. They yeah. had a business coach because I don't give a damn who you are. You're not going to know everything about everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you need that person to kind of like slap your hand, you know. Um, and people and say, can tell. Do it right, you know. People can tell. Oh, yeah. If you walk into a meeting and they say, can you help us do this project, they can tell if you're pooping yourself or if you're like, or if you can take a step back and you say, well, that hasn't been done yet. Let me, you know, like Adam says, let me take a minute, let me sleep on it, and I'm going to come back and I'll and I'll give you a more educated answer, rather than, you know, even if you come in all gung ho, oh yeah, totally, we're going to do that and blah blah blah, and then you end up ruining a complete project and uh, and money's being wasted. Yeah. Yeah, that's where your yeah. um, your reputation is gets squandered. And then if you don't want to work in corporate America, ruin a couple projects. No one's going to want to work with you. You're going to end up in corporate America. Yeah, <laughs> probably <laughs> selling tennis shoes. <laughs> uh, interesting enough, you brought up that movie. You know, the indie game one. You know, I think a couple years ago we've had the influxion of like indie games and people wanting to be indie. So it's been a lot of what we're talking about now of people breaking out on their own and say, I'm just gonna do myself. I want to work for myself. I want to work work on my own thing, which you know, like I said before, I'm not I'm not knocking that part. But I do I do feel like I've seen among um colleagues and friends and people I've watched on Facebook and Kickstarters and stuff like that of people fail at it because they don't realize how hard it is. To make a game yeah. until they get until they get that money from Kickstarter, they're like, "Oh, cool! I raised five hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter to do this iPhone game or do this Unity game." Now you're a developer, right? And now you have that same type of 
like weight on your shoulders that I did yeah. when I knew my game yeah. needed to come out and I worked for a bigger company. I had a big company behind me. That was just you. You've <laughs> taken these people money. You, through PayPal, have taken these people money on <laughs> Kickstarter. Now build a game. Yeah. And they're like, oh crap, I need I need a it's not just quitting my job. It's not just like right now the schedule, you know. It's like, oh snap, six months in, you got that first big game breaking bug. Right. But you have to get it out by Christmas because you told Kickstarter you get, you get it out by Christmas. Mm-hmm. You know, and we keep seeing, I don't know how many Kickstarters. I wish there was a documentary on the failures of Kickstarter okay. in terms of for gaming. Because you know how there was, long that documentary would be? Yeah, because <laughs> I don't know, right? <laughs> or just, you know, because I think people forget how hard it is to do to do that. And people that jump off to be indie, I don't, I don't want to say that they did it because they wanted to be more hipster or whatever, but there was a thing for a while to be indie. I think maybe people came to their senses, and even though people are still breaking out on their own, which is totally fine, have some like experience or some know-how, or set yourself up for a win. Put people around you that, that'll make your team better. Because um, anybody can come out with a really cool video and, and catch somebody's $10, $20, you know? And do it a hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand times, you know, to uh, to get it out. Um, but it's that experience. So think of people like the guys that made Monument Valley, or the guys that did uh, um, Journey, and all these other studios, which which the Journey guys were like students, you know, it was like their senior thesis or whatever, right? But they had the right type of mentorship through instructors and teachers and stuff like that that made their projects really great. Even though they didn't have maybe all that experience, they had enough there, and they were really smart at what they did. They were really good coders. They were really good artists, you know? Like, those things are are needed rather than just a really cool video or a cool spec demo, you know? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Glad you brought that up, Adam. It's like, most people don't talk about that. They just promote the whole, do it on your own. Do it. You can do it. <laughs> Don't work for nobody. <laughs> I can't stand it. I'm sorry. <laughs> All good. All right, we got about we got about five minutes to kill. Oh. Uh, yeah, we're get, we're wrap it up. We're getting getting close to two hours here. Uh, What's but the... similar to the Flash plugin, it looks like Sun is going to quit working on the Java plugin. Now, I don't, uh, real quick, I don't understand this one. Why? Um, I thought they, I thought they made it. See, this is how naive I am because I'm just an artist. Okay, so Sun Microsystems uh, created Java. Right. Uh, Java. I believe Java started out on the desk desktop, so you're able to write software mm-hmm. that runs on the desktop within within the Java player, right? So then they kind of wanted to go mobile, too. They wanted to have Java run in the browser, so then they went ahead and they moved it over. So now you have Java running on the browser, and there's some software out there that ju- that does Java. And it's great benefits to doing this, right? Um, about the same as why you would run Flash in a browser. Okay, okay. Because... Flash and Java are kind of competitors of each other. Um, as a matter of fact, visually, though. no, not visually. I think functionally, yes, but not, but not like a user wouldn't know that they're competitors. Yeah, um, yeah. Flash is sexier. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I guess Sun decided to stop working on that plugin. Maybe the witch hunt is on their way. They saw the writing on the wall. They saw <laughs> they just yeah. threw it down. No, we don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, or it just and, wasn't necessary anymore because I like I remember Carmichael Lynch. I think our payroll system back then was this old Java applet. Yeah. But you know, I, I remember Java applets like the 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 drops of water in a pond effect over an image that like every website in 1999 had. <laughs> that, that was a Java thing, so okay. I do remember that. Yeah. Um, you know one of, the, one of the gimmicky things that I did? When I found out that um, 
that a JavaScript can move your your browser around. Oh. <laughs> I created this. I created this uh, uh, this cartoon. It was called Free Falling, and it was this guy that had just jumped out of a plane, right? And he's just flying through these clouds, and then the parachute never opens. So when he hits the ground, the browser shook down. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> it, was cool. it was cool. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I I so. <laughs> awesome. Good job, Moment of fire. That's that's how you close out a show. <laughs> Someone jumping off and dying. In Shake the browser. The browser. <laughs> Shake it. Boom. <laughs> the best part. Um, and now, since th since both that and Flash are dead, anyone watching this has to shake their head to get the same effect. <laughs> That's right. Should we have a moment of silence for Flash? Nah, dude. <laughs> I've, already, I've already cried those tears. I don't want to. Uh, watch it have a resurgence. Watch they start adding a bunch of stuff to animate. <laughs> right? Is this a circle actually, of life? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I downloaded the... Uh, the bring installer you? for for animate. I just haven't been able to play with it yet. You didn't bring yourself to push the button. Can't do it. I'm going to. I'm excited about it. I just I keep I uh I got busy with all these projects, so I'm trying to yeah trying to get that done. Cool. With that said, Adam Smith. Uh, dude, I completely forgot your website. Uh, I, I, I Invisible Maker. Maker. Yeah, Invisible Maker Man. Maker. Invisible Maker. Uh, you are active on the social medias, are you not? I am. So if people want to check out what you're up to, where can they find you? Uh, on Twitter, I'm Adam Smith, just early adopter there. Um, Instagram, <laughs> I think I'm Adam Smith 1980. And then I'm on uh, Facebook. You might have to search Adam Smith Minneapolis because there's like. 800,000 Adam Smiths on there, probably. <laughs> that is a common name, Adam. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's the lifelong economics joke my dad played on me. <laughs> yeah. And Charlie B. Williams III, if people are looking Yes, Carlos. For um, if you're looking for me, you can go to my website <laughs> at carlocollective.com slash Charlie B. Williams. You see how he comes at me? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at char CBW3. You can find me on my Pinterest page. It's just CharlieBW3. Go there. Change your life. Um, Facebook is CBW CharlieBW3 also. Facebook.com slash CharlieBW3. And I'm there. And depending on the uh, conversation on Twitter, you may see me responding to Steve Tukowski. <laughs> What's up, Steve? He's <laughs> <laughs> lively debate. Reply Steve, to me, Steve. Steve, Charlie's hungry for you, kid. He wants to come at you. Uh, and Jack Casper, Zach, if people are looking for you, where can they find you? I am at sketchbookjack.com and uh, sketchbookjack on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, all that good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. And I am Carlos Gomez. You can find me at carlosrgomez.com. You can always go on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and search for Coconut Justice. This is the Sketch Zone podcast. You can find us at sketch.zone. If you're on Twitter, it's at sketchzone, facebook.com slash the sketch zone. If you're on YouTube, you can go to youtube.com slash sketch zone podcast. And as always, you can find us on Stitcher, SoundCloud, and of course, everyone's favorite, iTunes. That's it for us, everyone. Have a great week. Actually, we have a show on Saturday. See you guys on Saturday. Yep. See ya. Bye. <laughs>